They say that history is the version of events as recorded by the people who won the war. The voices of the defeated are rarely preserved, quickly forgotten, and generally speaking, lost to history with very few exceptions. And that can certainly be said as well of scripture itself. The Bible was written by the people who won, if not the religious wars, at least the culture wars. The ancient Near East was full of rival religions, regional religions that had various gods who specialized in certain aspects of life or nature or who were jealous of particular city-states. We, we really we call this personification, and I don't want to bore you all with theological details, but, but that's one of the most important aspects of understanding the early evolution of religion is that people gave personality to aspects of life. You, you give a god or a goddess's name either to personal characteristics or to aspects of life, but also in the ancient world it was oftentimes a hilltop. There were hilltop altars or mountaintop temples that were as close to the gods as you could get. But the Bible that we inherited as children was written from the perspective of the Palestinian religion that was centered in Jerusalem at a hilltop temple that was on top of Mount Moriah. There were other temples. This is, this is a difficult thing for those of us that grew up uh, especially in Protestant Sunday school, where there was one version of reality. One of the things David Trovish lectured about here uh, at some length was the rival Hebrew temples. They talked about Yahweh. They made animal sacrifices to God. They talked about Moses. They had the Ten Commandments. But their temple may have been on Mount Gerizim, or it may have actually been in the northern part of Africa, in Alexandria. But we don't hear about any of that. What we get is a Bible that was edited in its final form to make us believe that there was only one way of being Jewish, and that was to be at the temple in Jerusalem. That's historically not true, of course, but it is a sanitized version of religious history and it's the only one that we were taught when we were young. Even if you're talking about those settled and stable times in Israeli history when the royal family, the ones that lived in the palace, and the priesthood that operated the temple agreed with each other. That's one of the most dangerous things that can ever happen in any nation when the priesthood and the government get into sync with each other, and that's when things start to go bad for poor people. But even when it was that harmonious, and there was a fiercely dominant state religion, and, and as Christians, we all have a memory of this, when Christianity was the presumed dominant state religion in the, early, in the first half of the 20th century. A lot of our Christian affectation that was a part of our childhood really wasn't a part of the founding of our country, but it became a part of our country in the middle part of the 20th century. Even still, there were always, even when it was that dominant, there was always a few people that dabbled in superstition, that toyed with other religions, kinds of magical thinking, you know, the kind of people that you know, they, they're fundamentalists, they, they go to a, a hardcore Christian church, but then they read the horoscope every day in the newspaper, you know, they, you know kind of like you're hedging your bets, I'm, I am this one religion, but I've, I've got this other one. And, and there were also always those present who were at the other end of the intellectual spectrum, who spoke the language of the dominant religion. You can you can go to church, you can go to a cathedral, you can go to a temple and participate in the dominant religion while intellectually you're understanding this at a much deeper level. You're understanding it as not literal. You're understanding it as grasping after the values. That's why we personify something that we really cherish, that you give wisdom the name of a goddess because it is to be desired. I'm fond of the saying that theology is a lot like a public swimming pool where all the splashing and noise comes from the shallow end, but that doesn't mean that there's not a deep end. 
there is always a deep end where the more serious and strong swimmers are to be found. Well, I'm going to add some value judgments to this at no extra charge. If you read even the dialogues of Plato, you see that 400 years before Jesus, in Greek society, there were thinkers who understood that religious myths were part of the language of the, of the society, but they didn't take the religion seriously in a literal way. They took it seriously as an inspiration to virtue. And Socrates, as Plato describes him in the Republic, describes exactingly how the public religion is to be shaped to educate the people to virtues, to honesty, to hard work, and to acceding to the fact that smarter people are in charge of the government and they should obey them. We get hints and echoes of the same even from the sanitized views of the religion described in the Hebrew Bible. As the Palestinian religion rubbed up against Greek culture more and more, we see the suggestion of an alternative goddess. Now that's always weird in a monotheistic faith. And, and I tell my students in Western religion class that I teach every year, no monotheism has ever survived consistently. That every monotheism finds that having only one God is inadequate to account for what we experience in the world. It's always wonderful when you hear people trying to do these uh, philosophical gyrations to describe the Christian trinity and still insist on monotheism. It cannot rationally be done. But even more importantly is the notion that we have to create Satan or the devil, who is a virtual god, to account for the bad stuff. And this, this begins at the very beginning of monotheism. Zoroastrianism was probably the first documented monotheism, but right after articulating that there's only one god, Ahara uh, Mazda, you have to then create an evil god to account for why so many bad things actually happen in life. But in, in this wisdom reading that we had today, you have a goddess who is being praised in the pages of the Bible, who is not God, not Yahweh. It's a female God, and it's wisdom. Now, it's much more than an echo. If you look at the fourth chapter of Proverbs, that's an actual hymn to the goddess who is known as wisdom. You always have to pay attention when a staunchly monotheistic faith is willing to speak out of both sides of its mouth that there is only one God, oh, and his best friend, wisdom, who, to whom we owe praise and honor. There were people in ancient Palestine that spoke of angels and demons. They're, you know, the, the most common religious artifact that we have in, in museums all over the world are these little clay statues of Astarte. And even conservative traditional Hebrews would bury the goddess Astarte in their field to have better crops. It was a common to use religious trinkets and little idols to try to have more kids, to have a better yield at the harvest. This happened. And Orthodox Jews who imagined that the one true God actually sat on a throne in an inaccessible inner chamber of the temple on Mount Moriah. There were people whose faith was operating at that level, that, that God was really in that room. But there were others who turned with religious devotion to wisdom, to intelligence, to truth, as if intelligence could be personified literally as a person, a person to be desired, a woman who was strong and intelligent. And it's not even subtle, if you look in Proverbs, the way they make that woman sound almost like someone that you lust after. Even Confucius chided the people of his day, saying, there is no man who desires wisdom as much as he desires a woman. That that passion, that lust, that young men often articulate in the most earthy of ways, these wise men are saying, Take that energy, take that desire, take that wanting, and want wisdom. 
want to embrace the truth and reject the, the darkness of ignorance and the superstition and magic even of the religious language of the day. Now, Greek mythology, the way it was eventually edited down, wisdom is a goddess. Her name is Athena. And there's this unmistakable symbolism that she is literally born out of the brain of Zeus. She breaks out of the forehead of the primary god, the almighty Zeus. As such, she was a mythic individual who personified the character and quality of wisdom. And you have to see some cross-pollination with uh, Hebrew literature and, and Jewish thinking with that kind of Greek influence of the goddess of wisdom. Who was to be desired? by ancient people who could see that their way out of the darkness of a primitive society was to embrace truth and wisdom. Now, our wisdom lesson today comes from one of those in-between pieces of ancient literature. It's attached to Old Testament material, but probably originally written in Greek and not in Hebrew. You know, that's uh, a no-no in terms of biblical studies, but we don't think there was ever really a Hebrew version of the wisdom of Solomon. It's a hybrid of Hellenist and Hebrew cultures. It's from what Protestants call the Apocrypha and Catholics call deuterocanonical parts of the Bible. But for our purposes, it is simply an example of how even in the ancient world, there was a striving to break free from magic and superstition that had dominated ancient civilizations and to inspire people to aspire to something higher, something more honest, if somewhat less comforting. Our good friend Dr. Charles Hedrick has mused about this point in some of his recent writings. Several of the honored wise men of history eventually became described as being either divine or partially divine, but that evolution of praise through the fog of history normally takes two or three hundred years. Gilgamesh was a king in Sumer, as his story, the Gilgamesh epic, is told and retold and edited, he becomes increasingly superhuman in strength and then increasingly semi-divine within 300 years. But for Jesus, there were people saying that he was a divine and human mixture within a generation of his death. Why did it happen so fast in his case? What was it about Jesus that called forth such a rapid promotion from sage to saint to prophet to demigod and finally even to God? Now, sermons, unlike college lectures, a good sermon really only has one point. It's a lot to hope for to have a three-point sermon. You know, you, I would like... Uh, for someone to be able to, to be asked on Wednesday morning over coffee, what did your preacher talk about Sunday, and for you to have one point still with you. Now, I'll confess, sometimes someone will ask me what I preached about by Wednesday, and I can't remember either. Not all sermons stand on their own two feet, ladies and gentlemen, but, but there should be just one point. But on this topic, there really can't be just one answer. The first person we know who tried to push Jesus beyond mere mortal wisdom into a divine role was a man who never met Jesus, but who did at least have a geographical and biographical reference point for Jesus, because that person was none other than Paul the Apostle, self-appointed Apostle, but he at least had been in Palestine, and he had at least met blood relatives of Jesus. So Paul at least knew that there was a biological reference point and a geographical reference point. Sadly, however, even though Paul was much closer to Jesus in time and space than we are, he didn't know as much about the historical Jesus as we do because he didn't care. He wasn't interested in the person. He was interested in the Christ, the mystical, resurrected Christ. Fifty years after Paul is dead, one of the first of the famous Christian writers whose work didn't make it into the New Testament but was very, very popular with the church, a man we remember as Justin Martyr, 
Martyr wasn't his last name. It's just a description of how he died. But he wrote, Now the Son of God called Jesus, even if only an ordinary man is on account of his wisdom worthy to be called a son of God. Now this is early second century. And from a passionate Christian who was well read in the Gospels and in Paul. But even he is able to say, even if Jesus was only a man, because of, and the Greek word is Sophia, wisdom, because of his inherent wisdom, because he was a reflection of this divine uh, personification of wisdom, he deserves to be called the Son of God. And Justin Martyr at that time understood, unlike many church people of today, that calling Jesus the Son of God was a form of praise. It wasn't intended to be taken literally as if that which is divine uh, is held within a human body. Now, in the early second century, Justin did not argue that Jesus had been born miraculously of a virgin. That story may not even have been in common knowledge at that time. He didn't argue that he was any kind of human and divine mix, but rather he said because of his wisdom, because of his message, because of what he said, what he taught, how he tried to correct the the distortions of justice and mercy and kindness in the world, because of that, we remember him as son of God. In that sense, we too are chosen to set aside the manipulations and deceptions of a creedal religion that has asked us to focus everything on pie in the sky and the by and by in favor of a religion that is a devotion to what is true, a faith that is rooted in rational evidence, in reality, and in facts. Folks, the best part of faith has nothing to do with denial of reality. Mysticism is not an embrace of fantasy over science. Our faith is a principled decision not to be tricked by the trickery of modern magicians who are not so much asking us to believe in demons and spirits and angels, but who are asking us to believe that their manipulations of currency, the economy, stock values, employment, military investment is somehow our new religious faith. Because magicians are always saying, look over here while they're picking your pocket over here. Just as the ancients struggled to break free of a world defined by fear of unseen spirits by giving their faith and loyalty to a more reliable deity, a goddess they called wisdom, so we choose to be free from a culture that worships warfare, bows down to the power of wealth, worships at the altars of banks, corporations, and a hysterical news media that distorts reality as if they were feeding us all through our eyeballs every day in our ears a cocktail of methamphetamine, cocaine, and alcohol and calling it news. And we choose instead an informed, sober, and sometimes rather somber awareness of reality that buffer, that's buffered only with hope that is born of faith. Faith that together, if we are willing to face the truth and the reality of our world, that we can change it for the better. You have been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.